What's up guys, this is a mycology update. I'm gonna do this pretty quickly, but I just learned a ton of cool stuff. So uh, there's a lot of problems right now, but you can see there's more jars now. What I've been able to find is these things. And the lid doesn't matter at all. In fact, it's like completely irrelevant to me. But this is a wonderful size. And in the beginning I had problems because I was trying to use these kind of mason jar things because I thought that it was better to use a lid that was made to be autoclaved and heated to be sterile or pasteurized or whatever it is, right? But I found that it's actually way easier to just use aluminum foil and rubber bands and then like, I'm trying to not use disposable stuff, but I, I also have interests of making this accessible for like Nicaraguan people. So I need to be able to use like cheap things. Um, and like, basically, if you're able to change the lid, you don't have to find a heat working lid. So you can then just use any glass container that you have access to. So that's a more applicable way for a lot of people. But I kind of just learned something really interesting actually. So if you can see these top jars, this is the second, yeah, second generation, okay? And you can see that they're not, gr they're not growing in this part, right? This one's starting to over here. What's interesting is that these jars, which are done with like a different strategy, are actually already almost fully colonized. You see how I can flip it upside down like that? And these were started like three times as little. So this had three times as much time as that one, okay? So what I'm gonna try and do now is explain to you why I think that is. Cause at first I didn't understand it. I thought that the stuff was growing towards, oh man, I need a carpet. Lesson, lesson learned. I don't wanna break these. You see how it's growing at the top, right? I thought that meant that it needed to breathe more, but that's not what it is. Or maybe that's part of it, okay? But the reality is this corn is too wet. It is too moist and I should have dried the corn because with the, the dry corn, it colonized it really fast, like way faster to the point where like, I could use a lot of this spawn. I have like five jars right now that are viable. I could put them in a substrate. It, it's, it's like almost like maybe another day um, and of course they, they can get, they can go a bit longer. It's, you know, they, they get, they keep colonizing the stuff they have more, but at this point, almost all the corn has mycelium in it. So this had a third as much time, but it's already done with this phase of its life cycle. And that, that really amazed me because it showed me how, just how much it matters, what it has access to. Right, and I, I gotta constantly improve this. I'm fully aware there are a bunch of problems, right? Like, I mean, it's first off, in a closet, there's still clothes in the closet. You see that? That's a big mycology no-no. I know, I know these things, but hey, all in good time, all in good time. I'll also have you know that I couldn't find agar. And then when I did, oh gosh, it was really expensive and they wouldn't sell it to me because it was their last bottle and it was a like pharmaceutical lab. So I used gelatin in a bottle. I'll talk more about that process because basically what I want is I want to have a big closet here and there's going to be all the little parts of the mushroom life cycle. You got the this part of probably over there and then you got some bullshit hanging from here with some mushrooms growing out of it because you can like compartment. Oh my god, I'm going to break one of those jars. Ah, you can compartmentalize it, right? So I could have this open if I need to give it more air, but that not open. I can line these with things. And this is also a common Nicaraguan closet. So it potentially could be a product in the future where I show how to grow the mushrooms in your closet, right? Because realistically, if I want to inspire a bunch of mushroom farmers, I can't just go out into the streets and like, talking to people about mushrooms. What I gotta figure out is how do I make an information product that has a viral nature to it and reaches a ton of people 
and then causes and influence, right? That's, that's kind of like the goal in almost everything I do. I think of how can this lead, to, is it possible for this to lead to something like that in the distant future? Is that feasible? Is that possible? And that's not the only reason I do stuff, but it's something I think about, right? So the way that would look, if you imagine this whole area as ready for, um, or it's just a closet that you grow and store mushrooms in, right? So the, the biggest problem here is that contamination is a thing, right? And this is a tropical climate. It's really hot here. Like in Fahrenheit, it's between 85 and 97 degrees on like most days of the year. Sometimes it gets cooler or a little bit hotter than that, but it's pretty stably 95 degrees in the hottest parts of the summer. Maybe it gets up to like 98 sometimes, but it's pretty stable. And it's really humid because Managua is like right on a lake and etc. Depending on the time of year though, there's a really hot time of year, right? Because it's the tropics. And what I first thought was that mushrooms can't really grow in the tropics, but that apparently is complete bullshit. Like it's not true at all. And they actually grow faster than they grow in colder climates. The problem isn't that you can't grow them. It's that they're more likely to get contamination and they go bad once you pick them very quickly. Oyster mushrooms in particular will go bad in about a day. So this is one of the reasons that they're not really sold that commonly, right? So we, they're the kind of thing that you want to know people who want oyster mushrooms and then you're, you're getting them to them, right? Because you pretty much have to have to use it or put it in a fridge. And if you put it in a fridge, you're not getting much more time. It's not like a shiitake mushroom like lasts like two weeks or something like that. Whereas oyster mushroom, way less, just a couple days. Like you can push it more, but they, mushrooms, you got to sell them when they're like nice and you know, they're sexy mushrooms, right? So back to this, what you can see here is older than all of these jars, right? And I actually started with six. I lost one to contamination. I'm going to show you what that looks like and talk a bit more about it because ultimately it's part of the process. And what I'm seeing now is that if I want to seriously do this and teach it in a way that is accessible to Nicaraguans, then what I need to do is have every part be compartmentalized very well. Because, um, and I'm not saying I'm doing this now, disclaimer, not saying I'm doing that now. I'm just saying, you know, I'm thinking about this, okay, okay? Contamination is inevitable and it's gonna happen, especially if I'm thinking of how can I teach other people and have them do it, we are gonna get contamination. Absolutely, right? So what's, I'm learning is that there's often an advantage to having more smaller jars than individual big ones. Like now, I thought that I should use these like big, nice mason jars, right? One, they were hard as fuck to find. Two, they were really expensive. These were like, uh, like $16 a piece, something like that. Whereas these are only $6 a piece, right? So I could get two of these more useful jars for less than one of these. Actually, two, like two and a half of these, right? And they're just better. And these are simpler. And I see now that you could basically use any jar. And oh, actually, you can see these are even bigger. These were the ones I thought would be best. And then these are a middle ground one. You can see there's these like ridges here, right? And then this is a regular one. So they're a little bit longer. And also you can see I put them on the side like that. And that's because I realized that they, the, the corn really needs to be dry. Like you, you have to, um, I gotta take a step back, don't I? Let me explain how you get the corn. Cause you don't just put corn in a jar. There's a process. You gotta do things to make sure that these jars are reasonably well sealed environments. I mean, I got freaking holes in it. Stuff gets in there. Stuff will get in there at some point. And look at this one. I got more holes in this one stuff's gonna get in right but that, that kind of outlines what what I learned from the first attempt is that um, with these oyster mushrooms at least in this climate that I'm in you, you kind of seem to they it seems to like the drier so the drier spawn I don't know I guess this is it, because this isn't the substrate but maybe from a certain perspective spawn is just a kind of substrate I always think of substrate as the next part 
But what you do is you get dry corn, completely dry corn, right? Usually really cheap. Um, in, in my case, I was getting it for like, each one of these jars to fill it cost me like $2 or something. And I was getting it from a more expensive store than you could get dry corn here. You could get dry corn that's like to feed pets or something. Um, incredibly cheap here. So that's what I would do in the future. And one of the reasons I was working with the corn is because I know that it's available in that form, right? And basically what you want is, you, you don't have to use corn, you can use a lot of different things, but you want something that has a shell, right? And that shell contains something that the mushroom can grow into. And the reason you want this is because you want it to hold its spherical shape so that you can move it around, right? Like for example, um, this jar I've been rotating, I've been seeing what rotating does versus not rotating it. I'll explain more about that in a second. But that's what you want, because you want to be able to pour it, so you actually don't want it. Like, you don't want it to be like that. That's not good. I, I, can't, I can't really shake this up, because this is colonizing the parts that it colonizes really fully, instead of just expanding into everything and then kind of growing strong. It's just growing a lot in a, in a little part, right? And you can even see that when I put this on its side, yeah, this is, this is bad, I'll, I'll explain that. This is just experimental stuff. But I put it on its side, right? Thinking that it was the air, and I also exchanged some air, and you can see that it didn't really grow that much. And that, that's another thing that I'll get into. Oh God, that was instinctual. Shouldn't have done that. So you want that spherical stuff, right? So you can pour it, you're getting that. And pouring it's useful for a lot of different reasons. Like I just showed you, um, if you can rotate it slowly, like what I'm trying to understand now is how would you have some kind of mechanism where you can be rotating it without increasing the chance of infecting stuff, right? Because whenever I touch this, every single time I do that, I am risking that I'm going to infect it. I'm rolling a dice. And every time I open it, I'm rolling a lot of dice, right? So I'm happy to do that right now. And as you can tell, I, like I'm not, this is not a lab at all. It is literally a, a closet, right? A, a not even properly clean closet. I, I'm not saying I'm being perfect in any way, but I understand the applications that I'm gonna need to do in the future, right? So I need to test a lot of things and see how it goes, right? you really want it to be pourable. That part is important. It allows you to colonize the spawn faster. And why is that important? Again, contamination is inevitable. At some point, maybe hopefully after you've gotten mushrooms, your cakes, so to speak, are going to get contaminated. It's how mushrooms die. You, they don't live for a really, really long time unless they have an incredibly large amount of substrate and certain parts of them can die without the bigger part actually dying. And that's how they exist in like certain cases in nature. But in, in a setting like this, they will always eventually die. You cannot keep a mushroom alive unless you are replacing the things that it's growing into, right? And remember what I was talking about about being able to roll them around. That's one of the reasons that it's so important. You need to be able to replace what the mushroom's going into to greatly extend its life cycle. What I'm learning about in these cases is what happens when the mushroom is in a challenged environment, right? And in this case, there's way too much water, way too much. And you can see that some of these are actually rotting. And what's interesting is the rot doesn't, doesn't kill the mycelium, really. Like, as long as the water goes away, the mycelium will actually grow into the rot once it's drier. But mold absolutely will just kind of infect. The, like, this is just nasty over here, right? But it's not infecting this, right? That would have happened eventually. But with mold, which you're about to see, it'll infect the whole thing and kill it. It's way more sudden, right? So you can learn more about how how this is this this mycelium is responding and one of the things you can see is that orange tint right that happens less when the mushroom is less stressed 
And you can see, sometimes there's very little, right? This is actually a jar, believe it or not, that I opened. I opened and took out this part, basically. And I used the top of this to colonize all of these, or all of these guys, yeah? And then I was like, oh, I should probably just get rid of this. There's no way it's gonna last. And then when I came and looked at it, boom, it was really solid. Like, look at that. And this was just like this. You see all that water? It was just like that. And all I did was pour the water out. And then I forgot about it thinking it would die. And then boom. So basically it was more like this. It was like this. And I took out a bunch of the top and I used it to make those ones to start them. So think about that for a second. This jar was almost exactly what this was. And these already colonized, even though this one only colonized when I left the water and these ones still haven't colonized. And I understand now that's not because I need more time. That's because there's too much water in this corn here for it to be easily colonizable. So it's like there's a bunch of asphalt, and here this part's drier, so it was able to grow into the dirt there, or the, the whatever, bad metaphor, but you get it, right? And so I'm just trying to really emphasize that, that with these oyster mushrooms, they, they really like it when the corn's more dry. And when I loaded the corn into these, it was actually like kind of dry, like you could squish it a bit, but it wasn't like hard like rocks, but it definitely wasn't, wasn't what I thought was wet enough. I thought it was too dry. But then I was like, no, I gotta try it. I gotta try from that other end and learn the balance, right? And you definitely want to it be too dry. Like you, that should be the problem you're thinking. Like, oh, maybe it's too dry. That's what you want. You don't want, maybe it's too wet. You shouldn't see standing water at any point. Like this, if you look here, you see that? You see how there's a little bit of water in the bottom? That's not good. That's a problem. And that will prevent it from growing in there and it'll buy this corn so much time that it can rot or mold or something. On the other hand, a lot of molds can't really grow in a fully wet environment as well. So you know, it's interesting, it's a learning experience, but you don't want that. You don't want it to be dark like this. Like you don't want that at all. And you can prevent it from being dark by keeping it really dry, but having some moisture and also by letting it colonize it really quickly. You want to have the mycelium colonize it fast because if you do that and use a compartmentalized system, then you can reduce contamination rates, okay? So now you've learned everything you could from this closet. Let's go and look at the example contamination jar, okay? I'm gonna close this. Oh my God. I'm amazed I haven't broken any of those, okay. Bum, 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 bum. Oh man, there's not much light. That's okay. All right, so this is a contaminated jar. I need to have it be lit better for you guys here. Maybe right here, actually? Yeah, that's better. So you can see that black part, right? Just here is all the white. But then you see black here and over there and also over there and over there. So essentially what happened is that at some point I exposed this to contamination and then I shook it up, right? Basically, no matter what, if contamination gets inside of one of these jars, it's, it's kind of out of the picture. Um, if it's like contamination due to a moist environment, I've had better luck with using the part that's grown in the drier area to then colonize fresh jars of spawn. But if you're talking about mold, once it's there, like this whole jar is dead, it's gone. I'm just keeping it alive in another area to observe how the mold kills it and what it does. Because I know there's some situations where the, the oyster mushroom can actually overcome other 
bodies, basically, but it by no means will do that normally, and you have to be careful about eating anything that has any kind of mold and that kind of stuff, so it's just for learning, okay? But that's it. I'll see you guys in the next mycology update. Ciao! Oh, wait, feel free to ask any kind of questions. Like, if you guys want to know how to do this kind of stuff in a more specific way, I'm telling you, man, I'm feeling the magic with this mycology stuff, so... It's reminding me of the time, the dropshipping time, where I'd look at a comment and then it'd be like, oh my god, I could make a video about that. I could answer that with a video. That's, that's how I'm feeling, guys. So let me know. All right, best of luck. Ciao.